Shalom. We are continuing in the Gospel according to John. We are discussing the Hebraic background, things that are found in the writings of the Hebrews that are relevant to this Gospel. Today we will cover chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Yeshua was there. And both Yeshua was called and his disciples to the marriage. If we look back at the timeline previously, I had said a particular day was the day of Shabbat. We see that in chapter 1, verses 39 through 42. In verse 43, it talks about the following day, which will be the first day of the week, Sunday. So now we are three days after that, and that is Wednesday. And there is a reason why weddings were held on Wednesday, on the fourth day. Marriage with a maiden was commonly celebrated on a Wednesday afternoon, which allowed the first days of the week for preparation and enabled the husband, if he had a charge to prefer against the previous chastity of his bride, to make immediate complaint before the local Sanhedrin, which sat every Thursday. This is written in Kituvot. Now it's significant that Yeshua's first miracle was at a wedding, and we'll talk about this in a bit. Israel knows that Yudhivavhe is their husband, as it is written in Isaiah 54, 5. For thy maker is thine husband, Yahweh of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. Again in Jeremiah 3, 14. Turn, O backsliding children, saith Yahweh, for I am married unto you, and I will take you, one of a city, and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Marriage is regarded as a sacrament, and entrance into the married state was thought to carry the forgiveness of sins. Continuing in verse 3 of chapter 2, And when they wanted wine, the mother of Yeshua saith unto him, They have no wine. Yeshua saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. This is the last recorded speech of Miriam, the mother of Yeshua, and it remains good advice. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Several times during the course of his life, Yeshua said, It is not yet my time, and we know that everything has a season. In Ecclesiastes 3, one, To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under heaven. Later Yeshua said in Matthew twenty five thirteen, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh, but we do know the season. Continuing in verses 6 and 7, And there were set six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece, Yeshua saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. Again, we see that John is explaining Jewish customs to Gentiles. We know that the book is written for everyone. A firkin is about 10 U.S. gallons, and just for comparison, a standard bathtub can hold anywhere from 25 to 65 gallons, depending upon your bathtub. Continuing in verse 8. He saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Yeshua in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Over and over again in the book of John, we're going to see his disciples and other people believed on him. And this is the purpose, the express purpose of the book of John, we'll see later, that we believe on him. So he turns the water into the wine, and this is significant because Yeshua is the prophet like Moses. Moses' first miracle was to turn the water into blood. Exodus 7.17 7, Thus saith Yahweh, In this thou shalt know that I am Yahweh. Behold, 
I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. So Moses is explained to Pharaoh what he has heard from the Lord, and he tells him that this will be the first of the signs that Yahweh will do before Pharaoh. So the two events are parallel, as wine always represents the blood. Continuing in verses 12 through 17, After this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Yeshua went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overthrew the tables, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Again we see John explaining about the holiday that was coming to people who would not be familiar with it. This specific time of year is the time for collecting the half shekel tax, as is written in Exodus 30, verses 13 through 16. This they shall give every one that passeth among them that are numbered, half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is twenty geras. A half shekel shall be the offering of Yahweh. Every one that passeth among them that are numbered, from twenty years old and above, shall give an offering unto Yahweh. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel, when they give an offering unto Yahweh, to make an atonement for your souls. And they shall take the atonement money of the children of Israel, and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, that it may be a memorial to the children of Israel before Yahweh to make an atonement for your souls. So it's written in the Mishnah Shekalim, which tells the customs. The half shekel tax was due on the 25th of Adar. So Passover is uh, starts begins on the 14th day of the first month. Adar is the, t the month immediately before that, the 12th month. So on the 25th day of the 12th month, which is about three weeks before Passover, they collect this tax. On the 1st of Adar, they make public announcement about the shekels. On the 15th of Adar, they would set up the tables of the money changers in the provinces. On the 25th day, they set, up, set them up, that is, the tables in the temple. Now, this business is actually a legitimate business. People are coming from all over the kingdom to celebrate Passover. They're going to bring their shekel tax. And they're coming with all different denominations of money, which they would need to exchange in order to have a half shekel to pay the tax. And they are coming with money in order to buy the sacrificial animals that they will need. They can't bring all the animals with them. They bring money. So this is a legitimate exchange business. However, the abuses of that business have been documented in the Talmud. The bazaars belonged to the sons of Ananias, the high priest, and they were destroyed in 67 CE due to the sinful greed which characterized their dealings. The family of uh, Ananias, the high priest, Cursed by one Rabbi Shaul in the Talmud. All this is written in Baba Mitzia 88.8. And of course, the disciples are recalling this verse, Psalm 69.9. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. When they see Yeshua doing this kind of action, it seems quite out of order. But they have a biblical reference for actions that would be expected of Messiah as they appear in Malachi 3, verses 1 through 3. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. 
Behold, he shall come, saith Yahweh of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who will stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto Yahweh an offering in righteousness. So we can see this as an example of a righteous activity, a righteous cleansing, which Yeshua is accomplishing in his driving out of the money changers. So now we have two actions that occur one after the other. First, he is at this wedding and blessing the wedding by turning the water into wine that the people who are celebrating this joyous occasion can be blessed by the wine. Later, we see him driving the money changers out of the temple. These two activities reflect a consistent pattern throughout Torah. That is, that the people first come into covenant, and then they are taught and subject to the Torot, the Chukot, the Mishpatim, all the laws and precepts of yud heh vav -Heh. We see Noah comes in covenant with God, and then comes, he builds a boat, and then comes the destruction, which is decreed because people are not keeping the law of God. We see Abraham comes into covenant with God, and then he is given at least the Torah of circumcision, and then, as it is written in Genesis 26, 5, that Abraham kept all the requirements, commands, decrees, and laws. Again, we see the people of Israel. They come into covenant in Egypt. They slaughter the lamb. They put the blood on the doorpost. They are delivered. They come through the Red Sea, through the Reed Sea, as a form of baptism. And then, after the covenant, God brings them to Sinai to give them the Torah. First comes a covenant, then comes the laws, the guidelines for living. This is always the pattern in Torah. Continuing in verse 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing as thou doest these things? We know later in 1 Corinthians, Paul says that Jews require a sign. And indeed, they have a history of receiving signs from God. In Genesis 9, verses 12 through 17, God is talking with Noah, and God said, This is the token, the sign of the covenant, which I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth, and it shall come to pass, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, and that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token, the sign of the covenant, which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. In Judges 6, verses 17 and 18, this is Gideon. Even before he does the fleece, he asks for another sign. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee until I come to thee and bring forth my present and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. And Gideon brings the offering, and the angel of the Lord receives the offering, and he sets it on fire. In Second Kings 20, verses 8 through 10, And Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, What shall be the sign that Yahweh will heal me, and that I shall go up into the house of Yahweh the third day? And Isaiah said, This sign shalt thou have of Yahweh, that Yahweh will do the thing that he hath spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten degrees, or go back ten degrees? And Hezekiah answered, It is a light thing for the shadow to go down ten degrees. Nay, 
let the shadow return backward 10 degrees. And we know that it does, and that, in fact, his life was extended 15 years. So the Jews have a history of receiving signs from God, and so that's what they ask Yeshua for. Finishing the chapter, verses 19 through 25. Yeshua answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the body of his temple. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed in the scripture and the word which Yeshua had said. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Yeshua did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So we have already talked about the temple being the body. We see that in several places. As far as what is in the heart of man, we can read Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, Yahweh, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. First Samuel 16, 7. But Yahweh said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For Yahweh seeth not as man seeth, for a man looketh upon outward appearance, but Yahweh looketh on the heart. And First Chronicles 28, verse 9. And thou, Solomon my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and a willing mind. For Yahweh searcheth all hearts, and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Next time we will go on to chapter 3. In the meantime, keep your eye on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.